Hi, everyone. This is Rohit from Lifestyle Mastery. I'm excited to have Michael Luciani, who's a managing partner and co-founder at Climate Capital uh, Fund. And, and she, he's also the co-GP of the Climate Capital Bio Fund. Michael is also the founding member of the TerraDose uh, Climate for Venture Investors Program and mentors for uh, Heart Science Climate Exodus. Welcome to the show, Michael. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So, you know, you have an interesting journey. You you started as a field organizer for Hillary for Clinton, where, you, you know, you, you were working with 50 volunteers making five to 7,000 phone calls per week. So I think that is that's interesting because I do have a let's sales business development um, background. I'm doing a lot of sales calls. But how was your experience working for, for Hillary Clinton? You know, I I actually think that in some ways campaigns can be very similar to startups because they have an extreme sense of urgency um, and they're a bit chaotic. So if you are willing to really um, push yourself and you're able to do great work, there's a lot of opportunity to be rewarded, be promoted, um, accumulate more responsibility. And it also pushes your boundaries, right? Where, you know, making cold phone calls to strangers is not something that most people show up comfortable doing. Um, and there's right. only, you know, one way to learn how to do that. Mm, got it. Interesting. And, um, and you were also, you know, uh, 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 part of the Tuesday company where uh, I think you built two consumer facing products uh, and you were able to raise funding from really high impact investors like Reed Hoffman and Chris Saka. What, what was the experience about and, you know, why did you want to build a build a uh, build a company over there. Yeah. So you know, before the Clinton campaign, I'd actually worked um, in the Obama uh, White House. And my hope after the Clinton campaign would be what it was to go back and work um, in a Clinton admi administration. Mm. So, you know, when she lost, my career plans were derailed. Mm. And I had had experiences on that campaign. Um, that I thought were really frustrating, where systems of how we contacted voters and how we organized volunteers seemed just like laughably outdated and inadequate. And so I ended up working with a couple of other friends uh, from the campaign to start a company. That was the Tuesday company. And we wanted to fix those problems, right? We wanted to build the software that you know the next generation of campaigns would, would use. We were some of the first people to kind of play with this concept of relational organizing, which is a fancy way of saying like, hey, instead of cold contacting strangers, why don't we match up your social graph, your cell phone contacts to the voter file and figure out who you know that we want to talk to and have you, you know, have a conversation with someone who you already have a relationship with um, making them, you know, not only much more likely to pick up the phone, but much more likely to actually listen to what you have to say. Um, so we we built that out, and we were in this moment of time where folks like, um, you know, Reed Hoffman and Chris Saka and and Eric Schmidt uh, was another one of our investors were very interested in you know, contributing to the next generation of of tools for participatory democracy. And so we, we were lucky enough to find them as, as supporters. Um, and for me, that was my first kind of startup experience. And I was the founder, I was the CEO. And so I was really learning by doing my, um, kind of growing up, my family is very entrepreneurial, but like in the retail space and not in the tech space. And my my university didn't really have any sort of entrepreneurship startup programs so it was all new to me and it was a lot of um learning by doing uh asking questions of mentors you know googling how to do something and just kind of making it happen very interesting and you know before the call i i talked about how uh you know uh spoken to the dvc team especially we had uh jordan bertrams who came the podcast became a partner at dvc i think um they're also one of the most um, uh, you know, active uh, investors on on uh, in fact, the syndicates on on uh, on AngelList, and they call multiple number of funds. Um, you know, how did how did you uh, get to meet with Sandeep uh, from DVC as well as uh, your co-founder Jenny Can? Yeah, um, so two different two different stories there. After 
we sold my, the Tuesday company to um, a subsidiary of, of Bloomberg Philanthropies. I had started angel investing. Sandeep runs, or at the time was running a syndicate called Climate Capital and, and also DVC. Um, like DVC, Climate Capital is very prolific. It's one of the most active early stage climate investors in the world uh, today. And back then, um, there was a huge amount of interest from LPs and from companies, and Sandeep was the only person in the middle of Climate Capital trying to put that together. And so I, I just kind of reached out to him and say, hey, you know, this is my background. I'd love to be involved. Um, and he brought me on to start running SPVs. And eventually we create a plan together to expand climate capital, to you know, have other deal partners running deals, to have a pathway for you know, new managers in climate, uh, to, to develop theses and build track records and to also start some thematically focused funds where we could have a specific edge um, in a very technical area, and like what Jenny and I are doing with uh, biotech. And the way I met Jenny was I had, in my journey of running SPVs and making climate investments, came to be quite excited about synthetic biology. Um, I came in with the conception that like biotech meant dealing with the Food and Drug Administration and going through a 10 year, $100 million approval process. And then I started seeing pre-seed and seed stage companies, you know, with revenue, right? And products in the market. Um, and I realized, oh, you know, if you're not making drugs for humans, you can, you can do that. And you can use biotech to get into the market quickly and you're not nearly as constrained by the government. Um, especially if you're not even doing food, right? There's biotech applications in the built environment and chemicals and materials. And in fact, if you look at a graph of emissions, the largest emitting areas are you know, manufactured goods, um, chemicals, food and food and egg. And those are the places where biomanufacturing can make the greatest difference of, of in our opinion, all the potential solutions that are out there. Um, you can actually, address more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions by substituting, you know, kind of an oil based production infrastructure for one made by engineered organisms, uh, which is what synthetic biology is. And furthermore, as I tried to educate myself, I started finding these graphs of the cost to read, write and edit DNA, which is like the code base for synthetic biology. It's the underlying, um, the underlying kind of cost of that technology um, and the underlying tools of that technology. And the cost was going down and, and is still going down faster than Moore's law. So it was just, I think in 2003, the Human Genome Project sequenced the first uh, complete human DNA and it costs something like $3 billion. And today that's an exercise that takes, you know, an hour and costs 200 bucks and a grad student can do it. And so these um, declining cost curves now mean that you can start a company without needing uh, a huge amount of financial resources. And that has led to currently a whole kind of uh, Cambrian explosion of companies being formed in that space. So I started posting about this. I was on the on deck climate tech community and Jenny started responding to my posts and, and she had the same vision and the same investment thesis. And she comes from a very technical background. She worked in uh, the synthetic biology lab of Nobel laureate, Dr. Francis Arnold uh, at Caltech. And you know, we, we found that we were a great complement to each other. And so we started put working together on some of these SPVs and eventually built out a track record of about 30 uh, companies that are pre-seed and seed synthetic biology climate solutions before deciding to raise a fund together. Interesting. You know, I, I, I was part of the On Deck Podcast Fellowship and then I double down on the On Deck BD Fellowship. Now it's being turned into Coho, but... Um, but I really like the quality of people there are on deck. But but do you think SPVs uh, help uh, helps you to build a build a fund, or do you think 
um, you know, um, even if you have that sort of startup experience because you're a founder, you, you've raised $4 million from three Ivy League investors, um, do you think uh, raising an SPV or, or you, you know, like doing an SPV is like doing a doing a fund every time for, for, a, for a new startup, right? But, but do you think that helped you in building the building the fund that you're running right now? Yeah, I think it helped us immensely. Um, it helped us for a couple of reasons. You know, one, we could actually go out and demonstrate that we could do the job of fund managers right. uh, before having to go out and, and actually raise a fund. So we could find companies that, you know, we thought were very compelling. We could get an allocation about even the same size of an allocation we might make from our current fund. And, you know, we could write up an investment memo and we could then fill up that allocation. And at any time the stakes were lower where a particular LP could choose or not to choose to invest, they would see, you know, on angel list what we were doing. And as we did a, you know, a, a good job with those investments, we built up not only our track record, but also the confidence um, of a group of LPs that liked the things we were doing. And so when we raised the fund, we could say, hey, you know, we've invested $4 million across these 30 companies. It's already been marked up 4X from those initial positions. Uh, and we also could, could share that we were raising this fund with the LPs that, that invested in those SPVs. And so about a, th a third of the fund um, capital that we've raised and certainly the first third came from those people. And, and that's often the, the hardest part is getting those first believers. Um, yeah. I think a lot of fund managers struggle with like, how do I do the first close? There's so many people that want to you know, be in the second close. They don't want to take the risk that the fund might not reach kind of a minimum viable size. And so I, I, I think we were that journey in the beginning first close part of the fund was a lot smoother because of the path we took. Mm, got interesting. And yeah, you know, I was excited about this uh, podcast because um, I've sp spoken to, uh, I mean, some, some of the investments that you've done in the past are uh, auction farms, which is a plant-based animal fad. I've spoken to the team um, and then um, all, all, also some really interesting startups like Otomo Coffee, uh, Living Carbon, um, uh, some some of them really interesting, but well, the one which we talked before the call was and the colossal biosciences. I think, um, yeah, I, I think when I saw this deal, uh, uh, which was syndicated, I was, uh, I just could not believe, you know, <laughs> there was a, a <laughs> deal like that. Uh, this is, you know, the world's first de extinction company, uh, and uh, super interesting because you know you were able to source out the deal. I'm really interested about this, um, company. How did you? Uh, how how were you able to you know uh, get the deal flow and able to invest? Uh, really interested to know more about the story. Yeah, um, my one of, a contact of mine and a friend of mine had seen them um, in their kind of inception of the company and was connected to one of the co-founders and had just mentioned it to me in conversation. And so I I reached out directly, um, being very intrigued and got to know the CEO kind of got to know the origin in Dr. George Church's lab at Harvard um, and got to better understand the ways in which the company could be successful and the, you know how much of it was um, an engineering problem versus you know kind of speculative science fiction and and I I was very enthused about it, though I was certainly um, initially a bit cautious, right? And was worried about unintended consequences. And, you know, it's it's basically <laughs> a real life version of the movie Jurassic Park, right? So of course, cool. you can't help but like think of all the things that could go wrong. But the reason we chose to make the investment was, you know, if we're, we as a species are not as successful as we want to be in uh, addressing climate change. Having the ability to bring back extinct species, a de-extinction company is critical, right? If we lose 
you know, whales or dolphins or salmon, um, once we have stabilized our climate, we will be, we will pay anything, we will do anything to bring those species back. Um, and we should, right? And, and hopefully we don't lose them to begin with. But the a backup plan seems like it would, it is very wise. Uh, and then the second reason that we were, in, we and I uh, was enthusiastic about the company is that as they are tackling an incredibly ambitious kind of proof of concept, which is bringing back the woolly mammoth, they are pioneering new hardware and software techniques for genetic engineering and in doing so pushing this field forward. And, and I had already started to develop my thesis that synthetic biology was the highest leverage yet currently most underinvested in kind of climate solution category and a place that I wanted to try to be catalytic if I could be. Um, and so I was very enthusiastic about that process prospect. And then finally, um, I think that the fact that what they're doing is, is fun to talk about and is interesting. And if it works, will generate a lot of public attention could be very powerful in driving, you know, people to start more companies in the space, people who work on the space, more funding to go to the space, et cetera. Um, so they're an interesting one because they, in our track record, in my, that we're, that Jenny and I have, uh, they're the, the largest markup uh, that we have, but they're not really a representative example of what we invest in because there's no other company like them. You know, most of what we do is someone engineering, you know, microbes to create industrial chemicals in a carbon negative way or making, you know, chocolate or coffee uh, in the lab to protect against deforestation, um, which is just more achievable perhaps, but um, kind of at an order of magnitude less audacious than than something like Colossal. Mm, got it, interesting. And, and, and do you think we'll have a, like a woolly mammoth by 2028 in the five years or so? I think we'll have a woolly mammoth. Um, I don't know if, if I think it'll happen in the next five years. I know that that's what the company is shooting for, but, yeah. you know, I think that looking at any endeavor of this magnitude, thinking about um, SpaceX might be a good example or Tesla, any sort of like revolutionary undertaking, it's always harder than you think. And it always takes longer than you think. So um, I would feel confident putting money on a bet that we'd have a woolly mammoth in the next 10 years. And um, I'm doing everything I can to support Colossal to make sure, you know, to, to hope it happens in the next five and, and we'll see how it plays out. And, you know, wh why do you think advanced manufacturing technology on earth, um, in, in your view, you know, that's what you, uh, you've talked about, uh, in, in your, uh, in your message and on, on your website. I, you cut out for the beginning of that question. Could you, could you repeat yeah. it? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, so you, you mentioned, you know, uh, biology is, is the most advanced manufacturing technology on earth. Uh, so, so, you know, why, why, why do you believe that and not, not AI or anything else? <laughs> well, I mean, biology has, is, is responsible for us. So it has already achieved sentient um, life and Biology uh, is responsible for, you know, near infinite um, diversity. Life on Earth has evolved to fill every possible niche, including ones that we would have thought would be inhospitable, like tardigrades living on ocean um, thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean floor. But more than that, you know, we can't even begin to approach the efficiency of photosynthesis in a you know, manufactured way. Um, the way in which our bodies process energy and calories is not something we've been able to um, replicate in the efficiency that we generate electricity and energy. And furthermore, I mean, just think about an acorn turning into a redwood tree uh, that might live for hundreds of years and you know, I think another example would be the iPhone is a wonderful product, but I dropped mine 
here and there and the screen cracks and it does not heal itself, which is yeah. a big bummer <laughs> for me. Um, so I do think that for a long time, biology has been an empirical science, right? We study it, we learn about it, done. It is now increasingly an engineering discipline where we understand the systems by which it works and we are tinkering with them to see if we can have them work on our behalf. And most of our economy today runs on, you know, some sort of derivatives of oil, some sort of petrochemicals, um, long chain hydrocarbons. And all that is, is crushed up, compressed dinosaurs and prehistoric plants. It's organic biological molecules that have been compressed into um, a different form. And when we're thinking about how do we decarbonize, you know, biology made those molecules to begin with. Using biology to make them um, in the future seems very, very reasonable and is a way that we can um, start to get off of petrochemical derived processes. And indeed, most of the active biological processes are not, um, you know, carbon intensive, but in fact, many of them are carbon neutral or even carbon negative, uh, which is a, a big improvement. Hmm. Current, current, interesting. And now, you know, you also mentioned like the a, a large focus is on electricity generation. You know, uh, you have the Teslas of the world trying to solve climate change, but seventy five percent of the emission comes from uh, how we make our physical goods. Especially, you know, since I'm work, working for a AI yes, um, e commerce as a startup where we are trying to reduce uh, carbon wastage, but but do you think you know fast fashion companies like um, the the chains of the world would uh, would move towards more? I mean, they're already doing that, but would move towards sustainable, uh, uh, you know, product creation. But um, how how is that emission mostly happening through how we make those physical goods? Yeah, I think that mm, the promise of synthetic biology and the the thesis that we're investing in is not only our you know, companies that make single use reusable plastics or fast fashion or any other example of, you know, waste, um, moving towards sustainability, moving towards creating something that's more recyclable materials that are more um, environmentally friendly and not just on the consumer facing side, but on the B2B side on, and on everything from your water bottle to the house you live in, right? Concrete and building materials, insulation, um, and even like the fuel by which we, you know, move these things around the world. Um, not only are they, they making that shift because of consumer demand, but the promise that we invest in is that this is a next generation of manufacturing technology. So with biomaterials, you will be able to create something very similar with actually better properties, more desirable properties from a consumer perspective that is made in a sustainable fashion. So companies will not be paying a green premium. They won't be paying extra for this sustainable thing, but they will actually be able to justify making the switch because it will save them money. They will be able to make their product in a cheaper and more effective way. Um, and in doing so, you know, we will move away from unsustainable practices towards sustainable ones. And these materials can be designed to be, you know, kind of infinitely recyclable, um, and we can make our supply chains more circular and um, more, you know, kind of in balance with our with our ecosystem and what our world can support. Got it. And and when it comes to uh, doing the due diligence, you know, how, how how do you how do you look at doing due diligence for? Uh, some of these biotech companies, especially because you know I've, I've seen when it comes to hard tech startups, been it, it takes its own time to get that revenue rolling in, but how do you do this due diligence really in the early stages? Yeah, I mean, I have, I have a little kind of mnemonic that I like. I mean, we're, we're looking at team, total addressable market, the technicals um, and the timing. And I, maybe the biggest part of that is the, um, the technicals. And so we're looking at what are called techno-economic analyses. And that allows us to try to understand how much the founder on, has penciled out the math of what their future unit economics could look like, what their unit economics look like today, 
what are the assumptions between those two states um, and how much you know of a fundamental science risk is there versus how much a, um, is an engineering problem where all the science is in place and they just have to figure out how to put the components together in an efficient manner. Um, and so that can guide, that will guide our thinking a lot because, you know, if you look at the techno-economic analysis for cell cultured meat, for example, the unit economics don't pencil out unless I think you have unreasonable assumptions, but folks disagree with me, um, on getting to lower than cost parity with traditional meat in the near future, right? And so a lot of people have invested in that category. And I, I think in our lifetimes, it will be, um, it will reach that cross parity or below, and it will be a big and important part of the climate story. But the techno economic analysis today says we're not quite ready. Um, whereas the techno economic analysis for, you know, something like using synthetic biology, to, again, to create industrial chemicals or to create textiles or pigments. Um, is very favorable. And that helps us to understand, great, like rational market actors will choose this solution regardless of the climate impact. And climate impact, you know, should be a, then added reason to make the switch because it increasingly it's something that everyone's customers care about. And that's that seems to us like a pretty darn good investment. I see. And you know, you know what's the most important question that you have to answer to say yes to an investment? Yeah, I think that for us, we're thinking a lot about not only the technical analysis, which I discussed, but the team um, yeah. and the total kind of addressable market coupled with the total addressable impact. So if this really works, Will it make a meaningful impact from a climate perspective? And will it be large enough to kind of be interesting and compelling from a venture returns standpoint? Um, and we've certainly seen companies that have one but not the other, um, yeah. both directions. And, and then we have to think very critically about whether or not um, the team is the right team to, to get it there. And one thing that we find often is that a lot of the entrepreneurs we speak with are coming out of academia. They're leaving a PhD program. They're commercializing a piece of technology that they've developed. Um, and it's a big change to go from academia to early stage entrepreneurship. Yeah. And in academia, there's often a bias against action or at least um, at a pace of activity that's pretty slow where you want to be quite considered and deliberate in each step. Whereas in early stage entrepreneurship, you really need speed of execution. And that can be one of the most important things to get the company, you know, from pre-seed or seed to series A and B. Um, and that can be quite hard for people that have spent their last years getting a PhD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally hear that. And, um, and what's been, I mean, you're, Talk about colossal uh, biosciences, but what's been your biggest hits, and and what did you learn from making those investments? Do you all do you have that uh, bias of making those sort of investments again and again? Yeah, I think that um, we are still honestly too early to know what our biggest hits will be, mm. um, but I certainly think that. What I have learned is that often, you know, your your both your hopes and your fears when you're having early stage conversations with founders turn out to be true, right? So you might the the things that look weak when you're looking making the early investment are often the things the company ends up struggling with the most, and and vice versa. So I I do think that um, you know having a bias towards companies that can move quickly to being self-sustainable and generating revenue is something that we're honing in on and replicating as is kind of speed of execution from the entrepreneur's perspective. Um, and then, you know, also thinking about the diversity of the team um, and, and the backgrounds of the team and 
you know, where those gaps are and, and encouraging companies that have gaps to, to really fill them um, as quickly as possible, because a lot of founders think that they can, they can do it on their own. And, um, you know, often that's, that's not the optimal way to go about something. Mm -hmm. Got it. And, and, and do you have like, uh, like, like an anti climate capital uh, portfolios, any, any investments that you missed out that you wish you had invested in? Yeah, um, I do. They're, they're actually not synthetic biology companies because, you know, I have been, I think, fortunate to, to have a bias towards action in um, building out our portfolio around SynBio. Uh, but outside of synthetic biology, companies I've seen in the space and chosen not to invest in, there's two that I, I wish that I had made an investment one is called Astroforge, and they're doing asteroid mining. Um, and that was something that struck me as totally ridiculous um, in the same way that I think Colossal sounds totally ridiculous. But when you really look at it, you do start to understand that it's a very difficult engineering problem, but it really is an engineering problem. We have all of the fundamental science figured out in terms of how to do that. and I don't know whether Astroforge will be successful or not, but I wish I'd joined them and just kind of gone along for the ride. Um, because I think I I want to be in a place to support these most audacious founders, and they they certainly are are in that category. Um, and the climate angle there is, of course, access to to critical battery metals for, for um, kind of needed energy storage and energy transition infrastructure at a significantly cheaper price and a less environmentally damaging way to get at them. Um, yeah. And another one is called um, Making Sunsets, yeah. where as a rule, like, oh, let me tell you what they do. They they um, are working on injecting sulfur into the atmosphere to do what's called solar geoengineering, which is a way to artificially cool the earth. Um, and you know there were two things I didn't like about that business. One is that sulfur is a pollutant; it can cause acid rain. Like, it's probably not. It's probably kind of debatable how how much that is a, um, you know, it's certainly not one hundred percent positive for the environment. But a little acid rain might be worth the price if we can lower the earth, you know, two degrees and save ourselves. Um, from climate disaster by ourselves an extra decade to decarbonize. And we might need and want to do that. Um, the other reason I didn't invest at the time was like, I'm, I'm always generally pretty suspicious of companies whose business model is selling carbon credits. And that's what theirs is. Those markets are, are not super developed and it's unclear to me whether or not they will get developed and when that will happen. But, you know, I wish, I wish we'd made a small check. I wish I'd made a small check just personally. Um, because again, they're they're doing something really non-consensus and something really audacious, and um, I just I respect that, and again, think it would be fun to be a part of that journey. So that's two that come to mind for me. Got it. Interesting. And um, uh, you know, uh, bef uh, you know, before the start of the call, I did mention about you know there's uh, there's a UK based company called Infuris, and they they're looking to. Uh, m m make sure that every battery is sustainable. There's a lot of interesting startups which, which has come out in Europe, but but uh, you know what business model disruption and adoption disruption do you think climate tech will enable in, in the next ten years or so, especially in you know across the world? Sorry, what which what assumption? Yeah, which which you know business model disruption do you think you know climate it's, tech will? Got it. Um... That's a good question. I think that I think that we're going to see huge business model disruption. Um, I think that the cost of energy, if we are successful in the energy transition, and, and it, I have no reason to think that we won't be, um, will continue to go down. And as the cost of energy gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, uh, a lot of things that were economically unfeasible become feasible. And the companies that 
we are investing in today, we call them climate tech because they are decarbonizing. But I, I, I have a couple of fund managers that I work with relatively frequently and think very highly of who run deep tech firms and invest in similar companies and call them, you know, the next gen industrial companies, right? And it's the same companies. Um, and it's it's a another industrial revolution of using advanced manufacturing techniques, using automation, using synthetic biology, using novel chemistries to change how we make everything. Um, and you know, I think that the possibilities before us are are just as disruptive as AI, maybe more so because, you know, the Dow Chemicals or um, Monsanto's or, you know, pick your big incumbent, you know, um, corporation are all right now in a pathway to be disrupted by these next generation industrial companies who can make the same product at a cheaper level. And on top of that, it's sustainable in a way that they, the current industrials are not. And, and that's a good thing for the world, but it's, it's disruptive across the board. Got it. And you know, lastly, uh, there's, there's a lot of talk about how China and India and US need to do a lot when it comes to, you know, climate, uh, climate change. But what do you think are, are China and U.S. taking those steps towards having a sustainable future? Or is it, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, in the next 10 years or so, we'll, we'll see those sort of changes? Yeah, I, um, I think that we just lived through one of the most important policy changes regarding climate. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and so the, this, I think we just lived through one of the most important policy changes regarding climate here in the U.S., and that's the um, Biden administration's legislative priorities, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Bioscience Act, um, the Infrastructure Bill. And, and these have really spurred a huge amount of development here, a huge amount of investment here, and has put us in a position where I do think that we are on track to, 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 to achieve the decarbonization goals in front of us. There are certainly some bottlenecks. There's, there's some um, unsolved problems, especially you know, when you think about decarbonizing energy and how you connect all those um, clean energy projects to the grid. Um, and, but, but by and large, I think that the Rubicon has been crossed where many of the most important decarbonization solutions are now just more economical than the ones they're replacing, which means capitalism will bring us there. Um, that is what it is good at, and that is the system we live in. In terms of China and India, I do think that on an energy generation perspective, you know, they're they're looking at the same math. Um, and so they're, they're switching to renewables because it is cheaper and we'll probably continue to do that. Um, but on a policy side, you know, I, I couldn't tell you as much on, you know, how they're tackling industrials, how they're tackling um, food and ag. So I, I'm not an expert enough to speak on that one. Got to notice. And, um, you know, quickly want to do the top three. What's your favorite business book? Oh, good question. Um, favorite business book is probably um, probably the Lean Startup. You know, if someone is new in entrepreneurship, especially that was the first one that I read, and it made an impact on me, and and I think is is an important uh, one for for you know maybe all early stage entrepreneurs to read. Got it. And you know, if you could go back in time when you when you started. Uh, uh, on, on climate capital, what is the one thing you would have focused on on doing things differently? Yeah, I think that um, going back in time, I would have, I'm not sure I would have done anything differently. Um, and, you know, I think that with the benefit of hindsight, like maybe I would have made a slightly different portfolio than I made then because I was learning. 
but who knows you know maybe maybe that beginner's mind will turn out to be better than um what i'm doing today and i think that what i would what i've learned to do differently today is is also just to have more confidence um in my gut you know having now evaluated seriously hundreds of deals and made um close <laughs> made many, many different investments in the space. I, I think I have a, a strong kind of instinct that occasionally rears its head. And, and I think it's, I've gotten confident enough to learn to listen to that. And that's, that's served me really well so far. Got it. And, and do you have any favorite online tools, for example, uh, Gmail, Slack, Zoom? I'm a big fan of superhuman. I I just, I don't think that I would ever want to go back to Gmail. Um, nice. And so I rely on it a lot. And and I think um, most software tools, I don't feel a lot of affection for, but I, I really like that one. So if you haven't checked it out, you should. Yeah, we we have Vivek, who's the founder of Superhuman, came on the podcast. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, um, uh, yeah, you know, what, what is the, Michael, what's the best way for people to reach out to you and know more about Climate, uh, climate Capital Biofund? Yeah, so the um, Biofund has a lot of fun things in the works. We're uh, gearing up towards an AGM that we would love to invite people who are interested in learning about the fund itself to. And we are also starting to put together an incubator for um, entrepreneurs coming out of academia, especially those from underrepresented backgrounds, to um, kind of learn the skills that they need to be successful. Sure. So, you know, any of that or anything we've talked about, my email is michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at climatecap.co. So michael at climatecap.co. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Awesome. We'll put that in our show notes. Uh, michael, thank you so much for taking the time speaking to us. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here.